estranged from your family and all this it just never ends something about my niece's wedding coming up just really hit me it just really you know i've missed birthdays and holidays and everything all along i mean all this whole time i've missed all those things and it's really 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 painful but this wedding wasn't it was something different i guess because it's a one-time thing i guess because as a godmother i would have wanted to be there and here's the other thing my ex-husband will be there all of them have stayed in contact with my ex-husband who really abused me but obviously i wouldn't want to be there i mean it's just like my mother's memorial service i wouldn't want to be there my ex-husband was there too but it's really sad that i wouldn't want to be there i would love to be there for my niece i would love it if my niece and i had a relationship i would love it if i had a family their ongoing relationship with my ex-husband sends me a very hostile message they can't really say they've always been there and available to me as long as they're in a relationship with my abuser you cannot love me and have a relationship with him because he was terribly abusive he you know broke laws and committed crimes and you know did all kinds of terrible things and you can't be friendly with him if you care about me care about even care about my kids you can't the abusive family is where the parents needs are coming first as a function of doing that they will pigeonhole their children into these roles to play these roles and all about their needs, not about the needs of their children or grandchildren. Anyone who's a scapegoat is abuse. I mean, that's, that's just, it's just abuse. It's just plain and simple, it's abuse. They did things I would never have thought they were capable of doing. It was very specifically focused, focused on me and my children, which of course is painful, good to the extent that if anything ever went wrong in my life, it was automatically assumed that I was the problem and no one ever defended me or stuck up for me. I mean, that was definitely true. I was definitely on my own against any any enemies or anything I came up against. If you don't believe that, just look what happened with my divorce. I mean, no time was I ever needing family support more than that. With the dynamic that we had, with my husband being a diagnosed sociopath, he was actually diagnosed with both antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. My parents were not formally diagnosed, but my therapist, who I saw for years, had enough interaction with them. He felt confident saying that, yes, you know, I had a narcissistic family, and this that's clearly what was going on. But what was very interesting was how little self-awareness they had as compared to my husband. My husband was completely aware of everything he was doing. He was aware of everything, every uh, play he was making. Narcissists really want to be like the all-knowing, smarter than everybody else kind of thing, and they were being completely played. Their narcissism was going to protect him from ever being caught or called out because they would never want to admit that they were getting played, that they'd been duped. Got them to really fear that I was going to expose them and make them look bad for something that they had done. He knew that his worst fear was that I would expose him for being an abuser, at, you know, talk about what he was doing. That was his worst fear. And so he knew that it would be my parents' worst fear. He knew them so much better than I did. And he knew them so much better than they knew themselves. When people are projecting, you have to know, they believe it. They really do believe what they're saying. Now, when my ex-husband, you know, he would basically accuse me of doing something he was doing. That was not projection. That was just flat out lying because he knew he, he knew what the truth was. But my parents, a lot of times when they were saying, or my brother, when they were saying things about my being angry, or that I turned my back on everybody, they believe that. I, I think they do believe that because their narcissism keeps them from, from seeing the truth. What they really did is in conflict with who they want to believe they are. And so they won't be able to see it. And so their narcissism protects them from the things that they've done and it's also why they don't have a conscience it's why they can't be self-corrective the way that they retell the story it just didn't happen that way the way they retell the story they were the victims and they believe it it's very different with the sociopath he he rewrites, rewrites history but he knows he's lying he knows what he's doing and he knows he's playing everybody the myth is among all of them and with my niece who was a little kid when this happened she grew up believing i just turned my back on all my family and friends that's the story that they've all been telling for the last 20 years. I never made an attempt to tell my niece and nephew the truth. And so they just grew up believing this lie. So I did actually, in fact, write her a letter to tell her that I would never just opt to not be at her wedding. I would never have chosen anything over her or over my family. Never. I don't think she can believe it because it would cost way too much. You know, for her to believe that, she would have to come up with some other explanation then. And of course, there is another explanation, but that costs her way more than the explanation everyone gave her. I knew not to ask for support, but I just thought they would just stay out of it, you know. Uh, it was really a shock when they were writing declarations and, and doing things to help him and hurt me in my divorce.
It was really crazy. And so what ended up happening is they just did a lot of abusive things for a number of years at the, my most vulnerable moment. And they cost me a lot, my parents did. At one point, they seemed to sort of think the worst was over. They really were unaware of what they'd really done to me, but they, the divorce was over and they seemed to think the worst was over. And so they started just sort of acting like nothing ever happened. They wanted us to all just pretend nothing ever happened and go back to how things were. Of course, that was completely impossible to do. There was no way in the world I could do that. My, everything about my life had changed. We, you know, before this all happened, I was financially secure. I was healthy, able-bodied. I believed that they'd be there for me if I ever had a crisis. I believed they loved me. And I believed that I was safe. Well, now I know none of that's true. Now I know that they aren't there for me if I need them. They are abusive. They, you know, they don't think well of me. They don't see the best in me, all that stuff. I can't unsee any of that now. That's the way that it is. But I do go to them and I say, if they want to talk through what's happened, I'm willing to do that whenever they want to and with a therapist and they can choose the therapist anytime. And that was a very generous offer because it would be me going alone after all these really abusive things that they've done. But it only took two seconds for my mom to say, no, we don't trust therapists, you know? So she wasn't willing to even go that far to try and save this relationship with me. When my son died, my mom sent me an email, something that said, I'm crying with you over the loss of a precious Noah. And I wrote back, I'm like, but you're not with me. I go, you're not with me. You haven't been with me for 15 years. And our precious Noah was only 20 years old. It hurts to be on the outside. It hurts you and no one understands you and your family. It's kind of also validating because they're all so dysfunctional and abusive and crazy that it's kind of good that you don't fit in. You know, I mean, that's sort of a good thing. It's a testament to you that you don't, but it's still painful. I was really good at denial. I mean, I was really good at denial and I was really good at minimizing and justifying and all the things that we do. It had to be something that was so outrageous, so extreme. I died. I literally flatlined and died. My grandparents were upset, had normal reactions. They were upset, my father-in-law upset. My parents and my husband seemed mad at me that I didn't die. And it was such a shock. I want my worst enemy to go through that experience of having died and then by a miracle, you know, surviving and then having to face the people that are closest to you clearly telling you they wish you had died. All my life I kind of had these thoughts, you know, like, I wonder if they don't love me. I don't feel special to them, or uh, I don't feel like my mom even likes me. You know, different things like that. You know, and you always kind of hope, oh, you know, you're just being overly emotional. I'm sure that if push comes to shove, they'll be there for you, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out not to be true. All those fears that I had, like fears that if I ever had needs, I'd end up being abandoned. Fears that if I couldn't do all the things that I was doing, that they wouldn't see any point in the relationship anymore. It was all proving to be true. My husband was telling me, now that we were successful in business, he didn't think he needed me anymore. And now that we had, uh, you know, two kids and I was over 30 years old and all this stuff that he didn't see me as quite the asset. I built a whole life around these people. And I started to see that it was all an illusion. It was all fake. It wasn't, it wasn't real. There's a grieving process you have to go through. We don't want to be back in that family. We don't want to be back in that abuse. We want a regular family. We want a family that loves us. We want the family that maybe we thought we had. A family that we deserve. Two options we have are being back in that abusive family or not having a family. And those are both really bad options. And it's even worse because they'll never admit why it's this way. They'll never admit that I didn't just turn my back on everyone. But in fact, they all turned on me and sided with my ex-husband at my most vulnerable moment when I needed them the very most. When it was all over, I just stayed where they put me, which was in exile, which was exiled and cut off. Basically, that's when the story came up that I just had turned my back on everyone. If I had not ever married a sociopath. And if he had not given everyone the opportunity to really act out the worst parts of themselves, you know, if he, if that had never happened, then what would have happened is that we would have just gone along in life the way that we were. But it would have just been sort of these shallow relationships where I would have felt unsatisfied and like I couldn't connect. And I probably, hopefully, I stopped trying to, to be this perfect daughter so that they could love me, which is where I was when all this happened. I was trying to be the perfect wife, trying to be the perfect daughter, trying to be the perfect friend and everything so that I could be loved because I didn't understand what was happening. And of course, then I learned that my 
husband was sabotaging all my relationships and poisoning the well. And he was doing that because he was getting ready to do the whole discard and the whole smear campaign and all of that stuff was all happening. And it was perfectly set to happen, set in motion, and it was just the perfect storm. He just, you know, handled it like, like the sociopath he is. To be ostracized, you know, it can happen in work cultures. It can happen for all kinds of different reasons. But when it happens in your family, it can be ongoing and it can be very, very painful. I, I feel for anyone who has been ostracized by their family. However, if you have a dysfunctional family, if you have a family where you have narcissistic parents or siblings, your healing really depends on ending the abuse. So if you can figure out a way to not have to be ostracized, but also to not be continually abused and mistreated and triggered, that's probably ideal. But if you can't, if if they if the abuse just won't stop and you're constantly getting, you know, mistreated, then you might have to just remove yourself because you don't want to keep repeating that dysfunctional, painful history. You know, today they're all going to be getting together at my niece's wedding and it's tragic that I can't be there. It's, you know, thinking about her and thinking about when she was born. I was there when she was born and that's how close we used to be. And it's just very, very sad. I mean, I was really all about family and here I lost all my family and I even lost my son. Those are hard blows and I attribute all of it to narcissistic abuse. It, that was the root cause of everything. My estrangement, my son's addiction, my son's death, all of it. Let me house a little truth. I'd like to know your point.